Hello, my name is Bassam Kadri. I'm on faculty in the Department of Anesthesia. I'm also the Director of Technology Discovery at Stanford Medicine X, and part of my job is to source consumer technologies that are simple, effective, and novel. I'm also involved with the management of perioperative services, informatics fellowship, and also our physician entrepreneurship fellowship. So for those of you who are interested in applying, by all means, please contact me. Today's talk is going to be talking about mobile health technology and just a basic primer. The learning objectives out of this lecture are one, you'll learn about the role of mobile technology in healthcare. Two, you will get a checklist to see if your mobile technology makes sense and it's effective. Number three, you'll learn about the limitations of mobile technology. And finally, you will learn about the importance of behavior change and its relationship to technology. In full disclosure, I am a founder of a healthcare data analytics company. There's no conflict of interest with this particular topic, but I think it's important to disclose that. Let's take a step back before we dive into the role of mobile technology and think about research along two dimensions. There's healthcare discovery research and healthcare delivery research. And traditionally, when we think about healthcare technology, we think a lot about on the discovery side, either new devices, new vaccines, new medications. However, as the body of knowledge matures in that space and we get better science that solves real clinical problems, there's a new challenge, and, is, and that is how do we take all those resources and distribute them efficiently to a population that needs them? And that's the power of technology in the mobile space. It's not going to cure cancer, but it will help solve a lot of issues that deal with efficient delivery of care and efficient access to care. Healthcare delivery challenges that mobile technology could help with are information management, education, communication, behavior change, and compliance. Again, mobile technology is not going to cure cancer, but it will definitely help people understand what their options are if, God forbid, they do have cancer. Another important concept is what's called the healthcare iron triangle. Now, what is this? There's essentially three dimensions. There's a cost dimension, a quality dimension, and an access dimension. And the idea is fairly simple. If we want to decrease cost and increase access, oftentimes we compromise on quality. If we want to decrease cost and improve quality, we sometimes limit access. And finally, if we want to improve quality and increase access, sometimes we increase cost. And if we think about the challenges this way, that's where opportunities arise. And in those opportunities is a role for technology. So in this situation where costs are, are decreased and we expand access, we may compromise on quality. Is maybe there's a, there's a value or a potential role for technology there. Here, if access is limited, maybe technology could be improved to broaden access. And in this situation, maybe cost could be decreased with better technologies. But just using technology to solve a problem is not necessarily going to occur. There's a lot more than just the technology itself. There's a lot that has to do with human behavior and the context of how that technology is used. So what is the value of mobile technology? Well, it's very convenient. It's real time, it's easy to use, and it's highly affordable. And then it's a very effective tool for information management and communication. And probably the most powerful component of mobile technology is that it's with us all the time. It's part of our daily living. So that increased contact point makes it much more likely to achieve the behavior change that we want to achieve the clinical outcome that we're aiming for. Furthermore, the market is big and it's growing. Uh, phones are ubiquitous. A lot of people have access to phones, uh, even in developing nations. Um, and one thing that's, I think, uh, really relevant is that consumer technologies have ra raised the expectations for enterprise health applications. People now know that things are convenient, they're easier to use, and they're cheaper. So now this expectation from if I could get this on my iPhone or I could buy an airline ticket 
uh, on my phone, how come I can't check my own labs on my phone? So there's a lot of pressure to narrow that gap. Uh, there's is a report um, that said that 26, uh, the world market by 2017 for mobile technologies is around $26 billion. And a PricewaterhouseCooper report says that the potential savings, healthcare cost savings worldwide are around $400 billion. So there is a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of potential. So this is a really useful checklist. If you're out there and you're trying to determine, okay, I'm, I want to create a, a mobile application and I want to make sure that uh, people use it. And so this is a good checklist that you could go through as you um, develop your app. First, seems simple, but does it work? Is it effective? There are a lot of technologies out there that look nice, have nice uh, bells and whistles, but they don't, they don't necessarily work. So you want to make sure that your application works. Second is you want to leverage the resources or the leverage the assets that are within the phone. There's a lot of sensors and there's more and, the, and there are more and more sensors are coming out embedded into the phone. There's accelerometers, there's proximity um, uh, sensors, light sensors. So does your app leverage those, uh, those embedded sensors? Sec uh, third is geopositioning. Can you take advantage of the fact that you have the ability to geolocate your user? Maybe there's a certain uh, area where there's a higher asthma exacerbation. And there could be uh, triggers to inform people, hey, beware, you know, there's either some allergies um, that are prevalent in this, in this specific region. So again, think about what are the assets in the phone that you could leverage to uh, encourage the outcome you want through the behavior that you want. That you want. Connectivity, your phone is constantly connected. Either upload, downloads, and taking advantage of that feature uh, and building your application so that it's constantly co connected is something that you want to think about. Is it integrated? Either through Bluetooth, through other devices, and do you have the potential to integrate with other devices? Uh, a network effect is really useful for technology adoption and traction within a community. As other people use it, and more and more people use it, does the value increase for everyone? And is there an incentive or is there value for people to want to encourage other people to share their knowledge? This is very challenging. Creating an application that depends on passive data collection. And what is passive data collection? Well, if you think about it, active data collection is the user has to enter data, has, has to enter information to obtain value. Whereas passive data collection is you don't have to do anything. It, the, the device itself is constantly collecting data on its own, like a pedometer. You, you just have it on you and, and you walk and it tells you how far. So the more you could uh, think of creative ways to collect data passively and then make use of that data for the user would definitely add value to your application. And then finally, smart alerts. You know, the emphasis no longer is on content per se as much as context. So you Users, want, they don't want false alarms and getting alerts all the time. Uh, ideally, they want alerts that are relevant to them, either at a certain time of day or a certain geographic location or a certain clinical condition. So building the logic for your application to, to send out smart alerts to your users is something to think about. So when you develop your application, ask yourself, does your mobile technology really leverage these assets? Because otherwise, if you don't, then the question is why not just use a web application or, or, or something that doesn't necessarily really need uh, the mobile horsepower, if you will. Now this goes back to uh, a very important point is that technology, just throwing technology uh, into, at a problem is not going to solve it. Um, and I think there's this behavior paradox specifically with mobile technology. Any technology, for that matter, has early adopters. Um, and in, in this realm, there's a lot of what we call the quantified self, uh, people who are very vigilant about entering their own data, what they eat, what time they sleep, uh, their blood pressures, weights, and whatnot. Now, the nice thing is that, yeah, it's very uh, engaging, and you see nice graphs, and you get nice alerts, but the paradox is that the types of people who are disciplined enough and responsible enough to actually take the time to do that are probably not the biggest beneficiaries of the technology itself. In fact, 
what you want is that level of engagement and discipline and the technology is, is more or less the channel. So then the question is, how can technology be used to help the rest of us who are probably not as disciplined? So BJ Fogg's Persuasive Technology Lab has a lot of uh, useful information. He even coined a phrase called Keptology. And what is Keptology? Keptology is computers as persuasive technology. Okay? And his philosophy is that to achieve the behavior change that you want, you need three things to happen at the same time. You need a trigger, you need a motivation, and you need the ability to achieve that behavior. And a trigger is simply a call to action. And the nice thing about mobile technologies is that you could have a lot of triggers or alerts created in, those, uh, in the technology. And he also encourages putting hot triggers in front of motivated people. And what is a hot trigger? A hot trigger is a reminder that you could actually act on at that point of time. So that's, that's really key. The ability component is it has to be easy. If it's something really hard to do, it's probably not going to be done. So engineering the technology so that users could gain value out of it easily is something that you definitely want to design. And finally, users need to be motivated. It doesn't make sense to design something for people who are not motivated because no matter how easy it is, no matter how many triggers you put in front of them, if they're not motivated to use it, they're not going to use it. And again, these are some links that I definitely encourage you to, to look at if, if you're interested in learning more about uh, B.J. Fogg's lab and his research. I think the reason, one of the reasons why behavior change is very hard in healthcare is that the reward mechanism is not as visible or not as immediate. If you want to manage hypertension or cholesterol, if you think about it, is that these two diseases are invisible and they don't manifest immediately. You know, you could live for years not knowing that you have very high blood pressure. And the impact of that may be decades downstream. So an opportunity for technology or mobile technology is imagine if you had blood pressure monitor and you could project the impact, if you're on a certain trajectory of blood pressure, what is the potential impact of the future, but let people see it now. So that if you know that if you're on a, if you're on a path, of uh, a dangerous path of poorly managed blood pressure, the alert is relevant to you now. Again, this is a big problem for a lot of diseases in healthcare that are sort of uh, behind the scenes. Now, now, another problem is that some diseases are very apparent, such as diabetes. The challenge there is that it's perpetual. It's all the time. And it's very hard to keep uh, your blood glucose within a very tight range. So even though they're very, much more motivated to avoid uh, a diabetic ketoacidosis event, or the same thing you could say for congestive heart failure or asthma, they're very motivated to avoid that because there's the negative consequences of that are, are very painful. It's just more challenging to be compliant because the, the threat is perpetual. And then finally, data to drive change is not enough. Just having access to the data to say that, okay, you know, someone, uh, to give you, to be perfectly frank, a lot of people know that smoking is bad for you. You know, you don't need, we don't need more research to say that smoking is bad but it's still very hard to quit. So that's, that's a simple example of, you know, well, if we have the data, why is, it, why is it that that's not enough? Well, it's because there's a human behavior component to it as well. Now, it's not hard to imagine that part of uh, a care provider's portfolio of interventions, such as uh, medications and, and surgical interventions, could be mobile technology applications. Now there are definitely implications for this in the in the regulatory sense in the regulatory sense such as the FDA, but if an app can help a patient be compliant and adherent for uh, uh, a behavior change, and that behavior change is more efficacious than than a medication, why not? You know, so this is the construct of the way we think about technologies is more or less a tool. It's not necessarily a solution. So is it hard to imagine where a physician could prescribe um, increased diuretics based on a patient's weight changes? 
you know, having it integrated to a bathroom scale, getting the feedback, and having this type of ecosystem, it's not that far-fetched. And again, I understand that there's regulatory components on this, and you know, the safety and the efficacy. But as far as a channel of achieving the behavior change that we need, it's very easy to see that the role of technology or the role of mobile technology can be quite substantial. Uh, the nice thing too is that you also build engagement around, uh, around these disease states, around these lifestyles, and build a community and a support structure that could help people be adherent and also learn from each other as well. And then finally, we could better track of our outcomes and produce uh, feedback that is not only useful for the patients, but also useful for the providers who are helping uh, coach these patients and help manage their clinical conditions. So what will the future look like? Well, specifically with respect to mobile technology, the value is that the emphasis is no longer just on content. It's, there's, really, there's a lot of value generated from context as well. So it's not just about looking up what, what something is, but understanding what something is with respect to a specific time and location or condition. And the reason why that's useful is because it's much more relevant to the user. They know how to act on that information. So it's just not looking something in static uh, on, on Wikipedia, for example. It's, you know, this is much more relevant to me. Another uh, important uh, projection is that sensors themselves, the quality of the sensors and the cost of the sensors uh, are getting much more favorable for adoption. You could do a lot with a lot of these sensors. And um, even, even though even though you could potentially achieve the same thing on a sort of on an enterprise grade, if you could do the same same uh, sensing using something that's much cheaper and produce the same outcome, why not? Uh, there's definitely a push for what do you call it consumer diagnostics, measuring labs uh, over the counter or monitoring devices that are that are now not prohibitively expensive, where people could buy them for themselves or their loved ones if they're taking care of them. Smarter alerts, messaging, and personalized recommendation essentially boil down from the engines that process all the primary data and serve it up so that it's much more meaningful and useful to the end user. And that could be uh, certain diet restrictions when someone's looking for restaurants and ingredients, if someone's on a, uh, trying to lose weight, uh, if someone has certain uh, clinical conditions that restrict uh, what types of food they eat, that could be built into the logic of when a patient or a user wants to eat out. Um, the convergence of enterprise software and consumer software, we, we see this uh, quite a bit, is that on the enterprise side, the usability is an issue, it's a little bit clunky. On the consumer side, they have very uh, simple design, but all the data is on the enterprise side, and on the consumer side, you have a challenge of getting access to that data. Well, with improved data liquidity and the movement of data from consumer to enterprise, you're probably going to see a lot more exchange of that information. And the more liquid the data is, the more useful it is for everyone. And then finally, uh, with mobile technology, uh, building communities around problem solving, around improving uh, quality of life, around improving patient experience, uh, just the natural uh, framework of the phone and its ability to communicate very simply is a natural focal point um, for that type of technology. So challenges. Well, traditionally, uh, if, you, if you're developing an application, oftentimes you think, okay, if only the doctor would use this phone, or if only the nurse practitioner would use this, this application, and, and you have an adoption challenge. That is, that is a real challenge, and all I could tell you is that if that's the challenges you're facing is that you have to make it very very simple and it has to add a lot of value in terms of saving time. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily just focus on providers. In fact I would focus on the consumers. And consumers are very motivated to use these applications and they may have more time. So if you focus on developing these applications, what I, the two dimensions that I would focus on is making it very simple and effective. And if you do that, most of the time people are very motivated to pursue a healthy lifestyle. Security and privacy is always an issue. Uh, 
you know, there's, there's sometimes trade-offs out of convenience and security, but in healthcare, there's obviously a lot of laws that put a lot of uh, risk on providers. So they do not want um, to expose themselves in terms of risk. So that's something that you really need to think carefully about and, and, and take into account when you develop your applications. Uh, FDA clearance is going to become much more of an issue as these technologies become part of the, the toolbox of providers. You know, the questions are, are they safe and whether they're effective? And, you know, today I don't know if, if there's a final answer, but it's definitely a gray area because if, you th if it's just a recommendation, why should it be regulated? But if you're depending on that rec recommendation or there are sensors and, and whatnot, it, it obviously needs some level of, of diligence. Uh, the plus side is that if you do get FDA regulated, is that there is some level of stamp of approval. But it is something that is definitely a challenge. And then reimbursement. You know, the traditional model that we always think about, especially with technology, is, well, will payers, will insurance pay for it? And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that's the best way to approach this. And the, and the idea is that mobile technology is, is very cheap. It's not like you're buying a hip implant that's prohibitively expensive that you couldn't buy without insurance or a defibrillator. It's, you know, should the price point, I, I would say try to aim for a price point that patients are willing to pay for or physicians are willing to pay for. And the reason why that's useful is that now your, your end user is also the customer. So you have a fixed target to, to aim for that says, okay, I need to add enough value that this user will actually spend money on. And that, that way it sort of forces you to think about, okay, what is the price point that the user will pay? And hopefully I could, I could generate that much value. Um, aiming for insurance, just the cost of overhead and, and the end result may not yield uh, the results that you want or the patient or the provider. And these are some references if you want to look up more information. The World Bank did a nice report on mobile applications for health. Uh, the, the value proposition in the developing world is, is perceived even higher. Uh, because you know the access is a definitely a big problem, and, and information asymmetry is even a bigger problem. Uh, the Price Waterhouse Coopers report is also available, and I highly encourage you, if you're interested in the in the relationship between uh, behavior change and technology, to look at B.J. Fogg's lab. And these are a couple links to to that content. Thank you very much, and I hope you find this lecture useful. The stakeholders in mobile health, first and uh, foremost are the patients. Um, they're probably the biggest stakeholder. I think providers, uh, physicians um, and mid-level providers are also stakeholders. Uh, the public health at large, you know, when people are more compliant um, and taking care of themselves, there's definitely a, a benefit that the entire population uh, benefits from. Uh, Payers in, uh, are also stakeholders, you know, again, um, not to say that they're going to necessarily directly uh, reimburse for the technology, but it boils down to that if you're more responsible and taking care of yourself and your ability to, to use fewer high-cost resources, they're definitely beneficiaries of that. Um, and I think ultimately, though, what it comes down to the most important stakeholder, and this is what's nice about mobile, is that it's focused on the patient themselves. We don't have to align the payers, we don't have to align insurance, you don't have to align providers, is that the cost of mobile technology is so low that if you just focus on adding value to the patient, that's, that's sufficient. The most common mistake made is that people forget that a lot of times the users of the application are not necessarily as 
savvy as the developers of that uh, application. And uh, what's unique about healthcare is that most people who use healthcare resources or high uh, utilizers are much older. So there's a gap between the technology and the culture, and the technology is way ahead of the culture. And in healthcare, that gap is even larger, so that the highest resource utilizers are probably in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. So how do you design a technology that is new now for a population that is much older that, you know, it, 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 there's, this, there's that big, big gap. So it has to be very, very simple to use. Now, assuming that that um, is solved by making it easy, then the next problem is that a lot of the technologies out there don't even work. They're nice, there's engagement, and there's an entertainment component out of it. But they don't necessarily help you solve a real health problem. So I think designing for a population that is much older and designing so that it works are probably the two biggest mistakes that I see. You asked about hot markets uh, in the future. I think uh, the developing world, similar to how cell phones leapfrogged landlines, I see the impact of mobile technology in the developing world leapfrogging um, a lot of healthcare services that we even have here. Because they start thinking from the ground up, from a empty, like a blank slate, how can we solve this either efficient access uh, to care, delivery, uh, management. And I think um, that's a, definitely, I would start looking actually in developing worlds to see novel uses of simple technologies here to help them deliver care. The, the other side is the regulatory environment in the developing world is not as big. Uh, they have, the, for better or worse, they have more latitude about what they can do. And, and just because of there's less regulation, the, the, those savings in terms of cost and actually delivering on those, the, those, those societies will either benefit or get hurt, depending on, I guess, the need of the regulation. I think in countries like in the U.S., uh, I, I think the, the future is going to really depend on data liquidity, the movement of data. And I think a lot of these uh, technologies, specifically enterprise health uh, or medical records, if you will, are going to be commoditized as data becomes more liquid. And the value proposition is no, no longer in the application per se, but how do you make use of that data to solve a problem? So with respect to mobile technology, is now it's just going to become more of a conduit. It's going to be a channel. And you're going to have a distri distributed network that helps the movement of that data from point to point to s and constantly think about what is the problem that is being solved. And the more you could actually bring the technology on the back end and make it passive so you're not thinking about it, I think the more effective it will be. So technology will sort of become invisible on the back end, but it's constantly working. And, and the value that we de get derived from the primary data uh, that's either being collected by the devices themselves or integrated to a primary data source uh, and getting feedback and triggered you're going to have a much more cohesive ecosystem, but all of it depends on, I would argue, data liquidity. Without that, I don't think the benefits will materialize. Thank you again uh, for attending this lecture. I would like to invite you personally to Stanford Medicine X. Uh, it's in September 2013. Um, please, uh, you could find us online, and, and it's a great conference. You'll learn a lot. Uh, you could meet some great uh, people and really get inspired.